Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. I wanted to talk to you today about something that's been on my mind since discovering that people even held this view, which was really kind of new to me. I, I think I might have heard about it a little while ago, but not, not too long ago. And that is annihilationism. And I wanted to talk about why I do not believe that this is a sound doctrine or that it is an accurate doctrine or the correct doctrine. Now, I want to say I'm not trying to attack anybody. I am a lover of the truth, and I just go where the truth leads me. Jesus is the truth. His Holy Spirit, the Bible says, will lead us and guide us into all truth, and that's that's my only agenda, is the truth. Now, before we begin, I want to pray, because I only want the Lord to be magnified. So, dear Heavenly Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus. And I ask you to bless this message, Lord. I ask and pray your anointing upon this message, that people will be edified in this message and will be led to discover the truth that it says in your word regarding this topic of annihilationism. I ask only in Jesus' name that you be magnified, that you be glorified, and that the truth be made known. I thank you for this in advance, dear Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, I heard a sister who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter whether people take issue with some of her. You know, you got to always issue these disclaimers or people won't even hear you. But no matter what, no matter what, I believe that she's accurate on this message. And I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. If somebody saves me having to do the work, <laughs> I will grab it and run with it. Why should I have to do all this work? You know? But I'm going to read from, for you the definition of annihilationism in a second. But I wanted to say that I'm going to give her the full credit that she deserves as this progresses. She's allowed me to play this clip from her video. And I'll give you the full title to the video, and I'll put the link in the description where you can find the whole thing if you want to listen to the entire message. But she was actually talking about another topic. Someone in her chat brought this up, and then she referenced it and, and covered it, I think, quite accurately, quite succinctly, made some wonderful arguments. And I think they should be heard, so that's why I'm making this presentation. The definition of annihilationism is... also known as extinctionism or destructionism, is a belief that after the final judgment, some human beings and all fallen angels, all of the damned, will be totally destroyed so as not to exist or that their consciousness will be extinguished rather than suffer everlasting torment in hell, often synonymized with the lake of fire. Annihilationism is directly related to the doctrine of conditional immortality. The idea that a human soul is not immortal unless it is given eternal life. Annihilationism asserts that God will eventually destroy the wicked, leaving only the righteous to live on in immortality. Some annihilationists, e.g. Seventh-day Adventists, believe God's love is scripturally described as an all-consuming fire and that sinful creatures cannot exist in God's presence. Thus, those who elect to reject salvation through their free will are eternally destroyed because of the inherent incompatibility of sin with God's holy character. Seventh-day Adventists posit that living in eternal hell is a false doctrine of pagan origin, as the wicked will perish, as the Bible says in the lake of fire. Jehovah Witnesses believe 
that there can be no punishment after death because the dead cease to exist. Annihilationism stands in contrast to both the traditional, long-standing belief in eternal torture in the lake of fire and the belief that everyone will be saved, universal reconciliation or simply universalism. The belief in annihilationism has appeared throughout Christian history but has always been in the minority. It experienced a resurgence in the 1980s when several prominent theologians, including John Stott, were prepared to argue that it could be held sincerely as a legitimate interpretation of biblical texts alternative to the more traditional interpretation of them by those who give supreme authority to scripture. Earlier in the 20th century, some theologians at the University of Cambridge, including Basil Atkinson, supported the belief. 20th century English theologians who favor annihilation include Bishop Charles Gore, 1916, William Temple, 98th Archbishop of Canterbury, 1924, Oliver Chase Quick, Chaplain to the Archbishop of Canterbury, 1933, Ulrich Ernst Simon, 1964, and G. B. Caird, 1966. Some Christian denominations, which are annihilationists, were influenced by the Millerite Adventist movement of the mid 19th century. These include Seven Day Adventists, Bible Students, Christadelphians, and the various Advent Christian churches. Additionally, the Church of England's Doctrine Commission reported in 1995 that L is not eternal torment but not being. Some Protestant and Anglican writers have also proposed annihilationist doctrines. Annihilationists, based on the doctrine, on their exegesis of scripture, some early church writing, historical criticism of the doctrine of hell and the concept of God as too loving to torment his cre creations forever. They claim that the popular conceptions of hell stem from Jewish speculation during the intertestamental period. Belief in an immortal soul, which originated in Greek philosophy and influenced Christian theologians, and also graphic and imaginative medieval art and poetry. Contrasting beliefs include universal reconciliation, where all souls are seen as immortal and eventually receive salvation and special salvation where a positive afterlife is exclusively held by just some souls. That is the definition from Wikipedia. Again, I will put the link in the description area of this video. I do not believe in annihilationism. I'm stating that for the record. Now I'm going to present to you why I don't believe in it. And again, I felt this sister nailed it. So I'm using an excerpt from her video on annihilationism because I do not believe in reinventing the wheel. It's already been done. It's already been perfected. You find somebody that nailed it. If they'll let you just <laughs> defer to them. So this is Sister Paula from the channel The Bible Literalist, and she has a video called Perilous Times. And in that video, this excerpt was what I took from it. She permitted me to do so. Thank you, Sister Paula, for allowing me to use this excerpt from your video. It's very gracious of you, and I truly appreciate it. So here for your consideration is the arguments against annihilationism presented 
to you by me, which is Sister Paula's refutation of this doctrine. Anyway, let's go on from that because Chow wanted to also bring up the matter of annihilationism and total destruction. I forget the exact words they were asking him about. Let me go back up there. Um, eternal and destruction. Okay. So, this is one of the false teachings, annihilationism and universalism. Those are false teachings. Um, annihilationism teaches that the souls or spirits of those who reject God are annihilated, meaning completely destroyed, never suffering eternal torment. What does the Bible teach? It centers around two Greek words, one of which is usually translated eternal and the other destruction. We need to look at how those are used in scripture in the original languages. So first of all, there's no Greek word for eternity or everlasting. No Greek word for it. Instead, it was expressed as ages within the Greek with the Greek word aeonios. And you can look this up at Bible Hub. You can chase down these links. Let me, uh, I've probably already got the link, but I can grab it here real quick anyway. And um, so you can go look that up. Some count 60 or 70 occurrences of the word in the New Testament, quoting the tectonic site. 51 of these refer to the unending happiness of the righteous. Two refer to the duration of God and his glory. Six indicate an endless amount of time in other contexts. And seven appear in reference to the punishment of the wicked. So clearly the burden of proof is already on those who say it's limited. Even though there's not any specific Greek word for eternal or everlasting, they have to express it somehow. And someone might say, well, that's begging the question. And I'm saying, no, we look at the context and we'll see who's begging the question. The Greek word for destruction is apolumi. Again, Bible Hub reference, there are around 90 occurrences of the word. And the overall usage indicates the idea of that which cannot return to its former place or condition, which is really important. It's an exclusion rather than disintegration or being wiped out of existence. Annihilation or destruction means that to us, but it didn't mean that in the first century Greek. It's an exclusive term, a term that leaves something out. In contrast, the word luo in 2 Peter 3.11 means loosened, disintegrated, dissolved. Okay, so there's your word for that. That's a different Greek word. And then we have another Greek word, diathero, if I pronounce that right, means rotted or decayed. In both those cases, it's things being destroyed rather than people or souls. Looking at context. Scriptural references to the afterlife. The Old Testament says relatively little about the afterlife because people, annihilationists, always want to go there first. It does not present a thorough developed doctrine about it. So we will focus on the New Testament statements in the context that we find it. And here's a list of the most pertinent ones to the fate of the unrighteous dead. That's the big question. And again, to take them all as metaphors right off the top is to beg the question. You have to look at context. Matthew twenty two thirteen, 13, weeping or gnashing of teeth cast out of the kingdom. That's where that word is used. Okay, and about these, you know, you'd have to look up each Greek word there, but Matthew 24, 51 assigned a place with the hypocrites. Matthew 25, 46, the same aeonios or duration for both life and punishment. It, we have aeonios life and aeonios punishment. They're both the same duration. If punishment is limited in time or duration, then so also must be life. And then they will say, as I've heard many of them say, that it's only talking about, um, you know, that everybody's life will end. They do believe in limited eternal life, which is an oxymoron. Well, that, that's really stretching. Then we have Luke 13, 27, outer darkness. Acts 24, 15, both the righteous and the wicked will be raised. Why raise the wicked if they're going to be annihilated? Aeonios, alethros, age-long ruin, away from the presence of the Lord in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. Jude 13, the blackest darkness rather than nothingness. Not the same. 
Revelation 14, 11, no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and take his mark. No rest day or night. Sleep is rest. This is no rest. You know, this is sleep. I meant to say sleep is death as a metaphor. And it says no rest. Therefore, no death. No, um, no annihilation is what I'm getting at. So for anyone who worship the beast and take his mark, no rest day or night. 2010, the devils slash fallen angels in the lake of fire and torment for Aeonios. How long is that? No rest day or night. Outside, uh, in uh, 2215, outside are despised, miserable people outside of the kingdom of God. So, in addition to those, compare Matthew 10, 28, Luke 12, 4, and 5. Fear him who can Apollo me soul and body. The same word is in Luke 15, 4, for someone who has a hundred sheep and one is Apollumi. Was that sheep destroyed and annihilated and disintegrated? No. It was just lost. It was not where it was supposed to be. That's what that word means, and it's also used in these contexts of fear him who can Apollumi, soul and body. The annihilationists take this as meaning absolute destruction, annihilation. But then they'd have to consistently apply that to the lost sheep. It's the same word. One sheep did not get utterly destroyed. It continued to exist even while in a state of being lost. That's what the Greek word means. Matthew 15, 24, Jesus came to Apollumi, the sheep of Israel. To the Apollumi sheep of Israel. The lost, not the annihilated. Or Luke 19.10, where Jesus came to seek and save the Apollomi. Did he come to seek and save the disintegrated or the annihilated? No. Luke 15.32, where the prodigal son was Apollomi and then was found. So it's contrasted here, this word for lost and found, or the contrast. So the opposite of found is not annihilated. So going on here, if a person thrown into a fire dies, then isn't their soul also immediately destroyed? If not, why not? Why make them conscious of suffering even for a limited time? And what kind of God would make the dead, wake the dead just to judge their works? This happens in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. The dead great and small standing before the throne and books were open. This is the book, this is at the white throne judgment. Why are the dead raised to be judged if they're going to be annihilated? And why were they left in torment for who knows how long, depending on when they died, just to be raised up, judged, and annihilated? This is more, uh, uh, more evil than what the annihilationists think of those of us who do believe in eternal conscious torment. How does that show God's holiness and justice rather than sadistic pleasure in torturing people before he destroys them? How is annihilationism an improvement or moral high ground over eternal conscious torment on the basis of compatibility with a loving God? This is the crux of the argument. So when somebody expresses righteous indignation about the con concept of eternal conscious torment, tell them this. Why does God leave them in the grave, conscious, apparently, suffering day and night, Raise them up, as it says he will do, even if they've been sleeping. Raise them up to judgment and then put them back in annihilation so they don't know what happened. Where and when and how does that make sense? And how does it improve upon or claim moral high ground over the idea of eternal conscious torment? It just is ridiculous. Consider also what the purpose of an allegory is. For example, Revelation 5, 8, the 24 elders. And it shows that the literal incense symbolizes literal prayer. Then why can we not also say that literal fire or smoke symbolizes literal suffering? Because they will say the smoke is eternal, but not the suffering, not the existence, not the consciousness. Well, that doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense even, you know, using similar scriptural examples. Does scripture ever say that eternal torment is exactly like fire in every respect, for that matter? No. 
It's a gross misunderstanding of allegory in general, and this is what annihilationists do. Implications. There's reasons why we, you know, this is a big deal. This isn't just a difference of opinion. This is true for teaching versus false teaching. How does annihilationism affect the gospel? And I made up this hypothetical conversation to illustrate the problem arising from this teaching. And uh, Chow helped me out with this one day. We were live on this. I, I forget when. Um, Alex is the atheist and Chris is a Christian. And you can see this here. Chris says, you need to trust Jesus to save you. Alex, the atheist, says, why save me from what? Eternal separation from God. Why is that bad? Well, don't you want to spend eternity in happiness? Not sure. What are the choices? Well, the only other choice is to be completely destroyed. This is the annihilationist argument. So the atheist says, wait, are you saying there's no eternal torment? And the annihilationist says, exactly, that's a false teaching to scare people. So the atheist says, so if I'll be destroyed, so what? I already believe that. Atheists believe in an annihilationism. They believe there's nothing when they leave this earth that they are, they're just dead. Not conscious. Not existing. That's what annihilation teaches. And it's the same thing that atheists believe. Is this guilt by association? No. It's simply drawing attention to the fact that your belief is not biblical. It's atheistic. I um, just saw the comment. They brought up the smoke rising forever from Sodom and Gomorrah. And they said it made the smoke rising mentioned in Revelation also allegorical. Well, that, for one thing, the smoke didn't rise forever. And for a second thing, that's a totally different context. I mean, you know that, but it's hard to get people to see this. Anyway, going on with the conversation, the Christian says, don't you want to be happy forever and keep existing, basically? And Alex, the atheist, says, if I'm destroyed, I won't know I'm not happy. Well, wouldn't you rather keep living and be happy? No, not if it means I can't live now how I want here and now. Don't Christians suffer persecution for their faith? Yes, sometimes, but it's totally worth it to get eternal happiness. So the atheist says, so I should suffer persecution, give up control of my life to someone I can't even prove exists, instead of living how I want and even getting away with murder since I'll just go to sleep and never wake up? That's what annihilationism teaches. And the Christian says, okay, the annihilationist, I should say, let me explain it this way. You're a kid and your parents offer to take you to a theme park. You've never been there, so you say no. And they say, you don't know what you'd be missing. It'll be fun. You say, no, I'd rather play with my friends and do what I want all day. See, you'd never know the fun you could have had because you wanted to stick to what you're used to. This is the annihilationist making this argument. Then the atheist says, you left out the part where if I go to the theme park, I'll spend most of the day in the hot sun, dying of thirst, waiting in long lines, hardly eating anything because the food is overpriced. We all been there, right? But the rides, the prizes, the souvenirs, and don't you want to please your parents who love you enough to make the offer? And the atheist says, not if it means being miserable most of the time. And the, the annihilationist says, but when you get to heaven, you'll be with people you love, and we can't even imagine how awesome it'll be, which is true. But the atheist says, you're telling me I won't even know what I'm missing. Seems to me that the only people who will suffer are the ones in heaven who remember me. Who can argue with the atheist point against the annihilationist? I mean... What would you choose? Suffer now, be happy for eternity. Be happy now knowing you won't be aware of any internal consequences since you just go to sleep and never wake up. That's annihilationism. As the saying from the 1970s goes, do unto others, then split. That means run away. Those who get away with injustice in this life will never be held to account if you're annihilationist, which is the same thing as the atheist belief. So my conclusion was, the reason separation from God is bad is because all that is good comes from God. God doesn't send people to eternal torment. They demand it because they want nothing that comes from God. God isn't just love. He is also holy and just, and there will be a judgment day for a reason. I mentioned that earlier about why is it that people that God would raise people from the dead just to judge them and then wipe them out. So, above all, we as Christians must remember that eternal conscious torment is our motivation to spread the gospel, never other people's motivation to accept it. 
Salvation is reconciliation and adoption through faith in risen Jesus, which can never be forced, coerced, and especially not by means of fear tactics or deal-making. Any questions about annihilationism and why am I wrong in my treatment here? Somebody tell me the flaw in this reasoning. So let me look back here and see what I missed. Um, okay, we've got linkies. Um, yeah, don't go to the doctor unless you absolutely need to. Sometimes they come in handy. That, I mean, you know, if you had a burst appendix, you'd want a doctor in a modern hospital. Um, let's see. Waking them up to destroy them reminds me of an episode of the Three Stooges. Curly's sleeping and then slap, wake up and go to sleep. Mo. Well, yep, exactly. That's exactly what annihilationism is teaching. And what same person would go, that sounds like, you know, a kind, loving God. Uh, let's see. They brought, oh, the smoke raising. Okay, I did look at that one before. More links. Hey, Vic, good to see you too. And Annette. Um, let's see. Excited to see about the early church fathers. Yeah, <laughs> till you read about them. Yeah, annihilationism is popular because it's superficial. People don't ask these questions. Um, and it's hard to get annihilationists to even listen. Of course, I could say that about any disagreement. It's hard to get people to listen um, to actual counter arguments. But, you know, and then they'll, they'll tell me I'm the one who doesn't want to hear something I don't want to believe. But I, I think the evidence is on is the opposite because... I at least look into it, I listen to people's argument, and I do research, and that's why I come up with articles like these, because I've done the research and looked at what arguments they're actually making, and then I compare them to scripture, and this is what I come up with. I look at the Greek words, I see where they're used in context, and I'm not the only one who does this, and it makes mincemeat out of their arguments because they're relying on English words, or, tr or translation is whatever language, and they're not looking at how these words are used in Greek at the time in the context. This is all vital. You have to consider context or you'll get led astray. So annihilationism is just not biblical when you look at the actual Bible and look at all the context of the various words used to try to prove annihilationism. It just doesn't work. So... I, I don't see the, the how annihilationism makes God look more loving. I don't see how it motivates anyone to be saved. But here again, the motivation should be being reconciled to our creator. That's the gospel message. On the other hand, telling people that there are no consequences and they won't know what they're missing motivates zero people to want to risk suffering in this life because of it. So they're not thinking about that either. There are implications, like I said, for these kind of teachings. So anyway, um, yeah, the, the God's loving nature can't be separated from his holiness and righteousness, as Vic says there. Um, but the point is that God doesn't want to send them to eternal conscious torment. God is not, as I, I mentioned earlier, these other verses I had up, um, I think I had that in here. God is not willing for anyone to perish. I thought I had that up. All to come to repentance. Um, maybe I was thinking about a different thing. But anyway, God is not willing that anybody perish, but all come to repentance. And he is, does not delight in the death of the wicked. So... The reason, you know, there that are there had to be a place for people to go is be, to get away from him is because they demanded they don't want to be reconciled. So what can he do? And since every, as I said earlier, everything good comes from God, then the place of being away from God is being away from everything good. That's why hell or eternal conscious torment is bad. That's why it's torment. But you will your your condition in that separation will depend on how you live. That's why there's a judgment. Your soul's place of residence for eternity is determined by faith in Jesus or rejection of Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. 
But once you get there, you're judged on the basis of how you lived. And that's what makes it fair. God sends you where you choose to go. And then your condition in that place is determined by how you chose to live. So what could be unloving or unjust or unfair about any of that? I just don't get it. So anyway, uh, Jesus did quote a Greek manuscript, by the way. He, uh, he and the New Testament writers were using the Greek Septuagint as their Old Testament. Um, this is fairly well established. They were not using a Hebrew text at all. They were using Greek. Um, so yeah, they did quote from the Septuagint extensively. And he's probably spoke Aramaic, but I mean, that's a probably, but, um, you know, Paul spoke Greek. Um, everybody spoke Greek in the first century. That was the lingua franca of, of the civilized world was the Greek language. Um, you know, after the conquest of Alexander the Great. But the Septuagint was, tra was translated in during the ca Babylonian captivity because the Hebrew was falling out of usage and people needed something in their own language. And this is what Jesus and the apostles quoted from. So the thing is that the New Testament was written in Greek, all of it, and uh, we can't just dismiss that. That's the Holy Spirit-inspired text. That's the, in the inspired language. So I, I don't understand antagonism towards Greek. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, the reason I know it is because people were teaching dodgy things and I wanted to know what God said and get past the translations. So, um, yes, Jesus did absolutely quote from Greek manuscripts. That was the Old Testament. When does it, where does it say man's soul is immortal? Yeah, there are people who say that it never says that, so um, nobody has eternal life until they're saved. But again, you know, the, the Bible makes it absolutely clear that there are people who are judged, the dead are judged according to their works, and if their name is not found in the book of life, they're thrown into the lake of fire, and that this is, you know, no rest day and night. So what can I conclude from that, from the scriptures, except that the soul is eternal? I mean... You reason it out, but isn't annihilationism a reasoning out as well? I think it is. Uh, let's see. So I don't know if that answered adequately, but I think that this is something we figure out from the scriptures, that when scripture says uh, no rest day or night in the lake of fire and anybody whose name was not found written in the book of light is thrown in there, then soul is eternal. It doesn't say that the soul dies either. So there's that. There's no, you know, you would have to beg the question either way. But at least I have some scriptures to back up the eternal uh, existence of both uh, saved and unsaved souls. But um, there is nothing that says the soul is born dead. I don't believe in, the, in anyone's soul being born dead. That's a Calvinistic teaching that is a whole topic of its own. Um, yes, the Septuagint was the Bible in, in Jesus' time. Yes, it was. Um, the Old Testament was originally written in something called proto sinaitic and then Proto, or uh, Paleo-Hebrew, sorry, Paleo-Hebrew. Then the Septuagint, the Greek, that was more classical Greek. And then the New Testament was written in Koine or Common Greek. Those are just the facts of history. Um, so you can use them all. As the more the merrier, I always say. Use, use as many ancient manuscripts as you can get and compare them and get closer to the, the original that way. Um, and yes, speaking of God's image, I forget which psalm it is that talks about, uh, and also I think it's in James, talking about you know how we should not revile people who are made in God's image. It isn't talking about saved people in those passages. Um, so talking about not cursing people, just, you know, and um, people were made in God's image before sin, and it doesn't say that only the saved are made in God's image after sin. So, uh, let's see. Looking at the chat some more. Yeah, what does it mean that does, does it mean life or eternal spirit there in Ezekiel 18? Soul, you have to understand, has a range of meaning. 
and uh, called a semantic range, just like anything else. And the context tells us which part of that semantic range to use. The semantic range comes from its use in all contexts. And we're talking about mortal life there in that chapter. Um, so does it say that that soul is annihilated? Do we take soul as spirit and do we take die as annihilation? That would be begging the question. Um, so yeah, look at that word, the Greek word used kill in, or destroy both body and soul in, in the grave or in Sheol, um, in Hades in the Greek equivalent. That's because that's what the word is in the Greek New Testament. Um, look at that word and compare it as I've done in this lesson where, let's see, go back to this one, where we look at these Greek words. So you'd have to tell me which Greek word that is, look at it in context, and then get the meaning from there. So, um, looking at chats more, I think I'm caught up. So yeah, when you read those words, people make assumptions like kill or destroy, soul. Um, you've got to look at them in the Greek and in the context. And that's what I try, why I try to do these studies, because I look at the Greek words. I, I tell you, you know, for example, that uh, there are certain phrases and words that are used in different contexts, such as the lost sheep is not the destroyed sheep. Even though both have the same Greek word, destroy the body and soul and uh, lost sheep, it's the same Greek word. And you can't just say, well, in this one it means destroy, and then that one it means just lost. It's the same word. And the context is telling you, and if the context is what we're trying to figure out, does it mean this or does it mean that, then again, you can't, at the very least, you can't beg the question and say, it must mean what I want in this passage and what I want in that passage. You know, that's not, not how that works. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, anything else? I mean, we're coming close to our hour. But the point is that these are things we, as Christians, need to study. We need to know what times we're living in and why, you know, if, if we don't get a reprieve pretty soon, I'm pretty sure we're on the cusp of uh, the rapture and then the tribulation. And on the other hand, when teachings like this come around, that they're only able to stand by ignoring the Holy Spirit inspired text and glossing over the fact that the same words are used in, in, in you know, like if we have the word uh, apolumi here to destroy soul and body, but yet a lost sheep, they say, oh no, that's not destroyed, it's just lost. So, as I said up here, where was that? Um, Let's see, the idea of that which cannot return to its former place or condition. That's what being lost means. It could, could also, depending on the text, the text, the context mean separated from God forever. You know, context is everything. So, I'm, I'm you know, that that's how I would answer those questions anyway. Um, let's see. James Journey, John B., uh, thank you. Nice comments and all. And for anybody showing up, I'm always, that, that's what I mean by channel support. It's just showing up and maybe spreading the videos around if, if you think others could be helped by it. Um, but yeah, it, if punishment is only limited to a certain amount of time, first of all, why? How does that make God loving? And B, <laughs> second of all, um, it's the same duration as life. Jesus himself said so. Eternal life, eternal punishment. So, all I can ask anybody to do who argues for annihilationism is to read over this article, which has been linked in the chat, chase down the links for supporting documentation, uh, check the words in context. I've told you what the words are and where they are. And then tell me in this hypothetical conversation between an annihilationist Christian and an atheist, tell me what where I'm missing a logical point. 